section thirteen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter thirteen the elopement let us now return to rainford whom we left on his way back to london after having so triumphantly eased the vainglorious mr frank curtis of the two thousand pounds the highwayman for such indeed was the gay generous-hearted and brave tom rain scarcely condescended to bestow even a chuckle of satisfaction upon a victory so easily won an exploit so readily accomplished he would have valued the prize far more had it been obtained by means of hard blows and as the result of a desperate encounter for the love of adventure was inherent in his disposition and he had often courted danger in his life for the exciting pleasure of freeing himself from its intricacy having galloped his good steed to the beginning of the lane he checked its celerity and then proceeded at a moderate pace along the main road to the public-house where curtis and himself had stopped to purchase their cigars about half an hour previously riding up to the door of the little establishment the highwayman leaped from his horse and threw the reins to a dependent of the place who was conversing with the postilion of a chaise and pair that had stopped at the door when rainford sauntered leisurely up to the bar with his chimney-pot hat set rakishly on one side his white coat comfortably buttoned up and his riding-whip in his hand the landlord instantly recollected him again and observed as he drew the liquor which the highwayman ordered back to london sir to-night yes replied tom carelessly i just escorted my friend as far as torrens cottage and shall now get home again these words produced a visible emotion on the part of a tall handsome dark-haired young man who was also standing at the bar he was well protected by a great coat against the cold and tom therefore very naturally concluded that he was the traveller journeying in the post-chaise outside torrens cottage cried the landlord why i do declare that's the very ticket this gentleman here was just making inquiries whether i had any one that could take a note there in a confidential way the landlord blurted forth this announcement without heeding the significant coughs and hems of the tall young gentleman who seemed greatly annoyed that the object of his call at the public-house should thus be published to the very first stranger who entered the place after him you should keep a closer tongue in your head said tom rain how do you know what harm might be done by your stupidity in letting out the gentleman's business in this kind of way fortunately i am not the kind of fellow to do mischief and in this case it may be that i can effect some good indeed exclaimed the tall young gentleman his countenance suddenly exchanging the expression of annoyance which the landlord's garrulity had excited for one indicative of hope and joy yes i think so said tom but we must have a few words in private walk into the parlour gentlemen cried the landlord there is no one in that room at present rainford and the tall stranger followed this suggestion and when the door was closed behind them the highwayman said if i am not very much mistaken you must be the gentleman whom that lying braggart frank curtis is endeavouring to cut out my name is clarence villiers sir was the guarded reply and you are the lover of mr torrens's eldest daughter continued rainford now do not waste valuable time by reflecting whether you shall make me your confidant or not i am disposed to serve you tell me how i can do it you will excuse me said villiers in a polite but somewhat reserved tone if i first request to be informed to whom i have the honour of speaking captain sparks was the immediate reply i happen to know old sir christopher and his precious nephew and i rode down with them nearly as far as the cottage but i did not accept their invitation to go in for particular reasons of my own 
you may however suppose that i am well acquainted with all the particulars of this infamous case miss adelais torrens loves mr clarence villiers and hates mr frank curtis but mr frank curtis is the successful suitor with the mercenary father because a certain five thousand pounds enough captain sparks ejaculated villiers i see that you do indeed know all and will you serve me in this strait i will honour bright cried tom there's my hand upon it now say what is to be done it is already past eight o'clock he added after a hasty reference to a handsome gold watch which he drew from his fob my object was to obtain an interview with adelais in some way or another and urge her to to speak plainly my friend cried rain to elope with you well do you mean everything that is honourable as god is my judge said the young man solemnly i have frequently urged the dear girl to consent to a clandestine marriage with me but the purity of her soul has ever revolted against a course which she considers to be marked with duplicity where would you convey her during the interval that must necessarily elapse before you can marry her asked rainford because as she is a minor i suppose you could not obtain a special license without her father's consent i have an aunt in london devoted to my interests answered clarence and she would receive her with even maternal affection until i should acquire a legal right to protect her so far so good observed tom and yet a young lady eloping at night with a young man remember i am only speaking for the good of both of you i had foreseen that difficulty also said villiers hastily the fact is adelais and her sister rosamond are so linked together by the tenderest bonds of affection that the one would not move a step unaccompanied by the other the devil cried rainford two ladies to carry off that increases the embarrassment of the business now it is very clear that it is perfectly useless for us to send a messenger down with a note it would be intercepted by the father but if you will sit down and write what you choose i will undertake to have it delivered to the young lady herself you exclaimed clarence joyfully yes what i promise i will perform said rainford follow my directions and all shall go well clarence rang the bell ordered writing materials and in a few minutes completed a note to his beloved adelais which he read to his companion seal it said tom because it may pass through the hands of another person after it leaves mine and before it reaches miss torrens this suggestion was instantaneously complied with and rainford secured the letter about his person now he continued after a moment's reflection do you proceed with the chaise down the lane and stop as near the cottage as is consistent with prudence i shall retrace my way there at once fear nothing but wait patiently at the place where you pull up until i make my appearance villiers promised to fulfil these instructions and rainford having taken a temporary leave of him remounted his horse and galloped towards torrens cottage the highwayman had his plan of proceeding ready digested by the time the white walls of the building rendered particularly conspicuous in the starlight met his view alighting from his horse at a distance of about a hundred yards he tied the animal to a tree and then repaired towards the dwelling having reconnoitred the premises he speedily discovered the stable and to his infinite joy a light streamed from one of the windows of that building leaping over the palings which separated the kitchen garden from the adjacent fields tom rain proceeded to the stable and there as he had anticipated he found john jeffreys the groom busily employed with his master's horses john was alone and his surprise was great when upon being tapped on the shoulder he turned round and beheld the highwayman silence said tom in a whisper we have no time to lose an idle chatter here's five guineas for you and you must get this note conveyed secretly to miss torrens adelais the eldest you know it shall be done sir replied jeffreys i am already far in the good graces of the housemaid the cook is old and deaf and so there's no fear of my not being able to succeed good and you will bring me the answer up the lane where i shall wait for you and how can you read it when you get it demanded jeffreys the night is not quite clear enough for that the answer will be a verbal one yes or no replied tom 
jeffreys promised that no delay should occur on his part and rainford retraced his steps to the spot where he had left his horse many novelists would here pause for the honest but somewhat tedious purpose of detailing all the reflections which passed through the mind of rainford during the mortal half-hour that elapsed ere the sounds of footsteps upon the hard soil announced the approach of some person but as we do not wish either to spin out our narrative with dry material or to keep the reader in any unnecessary suspense we will at once declare that at the expiration of the aforesaid thirty minutes john jeffreys made his appearance at the appointed spot what news demanded tom impatiently all right and the answer is yes that's well exclaimed rainford you may now go back john all that i require of you is done but i have something to say to you sir observed the servant just now sir christopher sent for me up into the parlour to give me some orders and i heard mr frank who is uncommon far gone with brandy and water making a boast to the lawyer fellow that he'd walk all round the grounds to see that everything is safe it seems that the lawyer has been twitting him about his little business with you just now up the lane you know and so mr frank is as bumptious as possible i only thought i'd better tell you of this in case you've any business in hand that's likely to keep you about the place i am very much obliged to you john said rainford here's another five guineas for you and i shall not forget to speak to old death in your favour but you had better get back as soon as you can for fear you should be missed jeffreys thanked the highwayman for the additional remuneration and returned to the cottage it was now past nine o'clock and rainford murmured to himself i wonder how much longer they will be his horse which was a high-spirited animal began to grow impatient of this long stoppage and he himself shivered in spite of the good great coat with the nipping chill another quarter of an hour elapsed and to the infinite joy of tom rain he suddenly beheld two female figures well muffled in shawls and furs emerge from the obscurity at a short distance all right ladies he said in as loud a voice as he dared use consistently with prudence adelais and rosamond hurried towards him as affrighted lambs to their shepherd and yet when they were close to him they seemed unable to utter a word fear not ladies exclaimed the highwayman i am the friend to whom mr villiers alluded in his note save us then sir save us said adelais in an urgent and imploring tone for mr curtis saw us leave the house he was in the garden at that moment the sounds of voices were heard in the direction of the cottage and they were evidently approaching hasten up the lane young ladies hasten for god's sake said tom rain mr villiers is there with the post-chaise and i will remain here to bar the way adelais and rosamond could not even give utterance to the thanks which their hearts longed to express terror froze the words that started to their lips and not daring to glance behind them they hurried up the lane tom rainford now mounted his horse and took his station in the middle of the way for several persons were rapidly approaching from the house in a few moments they were near enough to enable rainford to catch what they said the disobedient self-willed girls exclaimed one whom tom was right in supposing to be mr torrens but wasn't it fortunate that i twigged them said curtis egad it will be much more fortunate if we overtake them observed the lawyer bless me i'm out of breath cried sir christopher i wish john would come on with the horses did you tell him frank to be sure i did we cannot fail to overtake them but poor things suppose that highwayman should fall in with them and me not there to defend them i think it would be all the same howard was interrupted by a sudden ejaculation on the part of mr torrens who was a few paces in advance of the others but who now abruptly came to a full stop what is it demanded curtis shaking from head to foot in spite of all the liquor he had imbibed during the day some ruffian on horseback there don't you see exclaimed mr torrens but i am not afraid of him his presence here is in some way connected with my daughters and the incensed father rushed furiously towards the highwayman stand back cried tom in his clear stentorian voice and this command was followed by the sharp clicking of the two pistols which he caught the robber exclaimed frank curtis clinging to the coat-tails of mr torrens who had retreated a few paces at the ominous sound of the pistols at him my dear sir at him i'm here to help you 
villain give up the two thousand pounds and we will let you go on my honour as a knight ejaculated sir christopher keeping as far remote as he deemed prudent from the sinister form which wrapped in the white greatcoat and seated composedly on the tall horse seemed amidst the obscurity of the night to be a ghost disdaining to touch the earth i am very much obliged to you for your kindness sir christopher said tom but i am not at all in fear of the necessity of purchasing my liberty at any price whatsoever i however give you every one due warning that the first who tries to pass this way scoundrel my daughters where are they vociferated mr torrens that's it give it him cried frank curtis i'll be at him when you've done go on at once cried howard and why are you standing idle there because it is not my business to interfere well done lawyer exclaimed tom no fees can recompense you for an ounce of lead in the thigh for if i do fire i shall only try to lame not kill mr curtis sir christopher will you not help me to arrest this villain who beards us to our very faces exclaimed torrens in a towering passion and again he rushed forward while frank curtis beat a precipitate retreat behind his uncle stand back or by god i'll fire thundered rainford suddenly spurring his horse in such a manner that the length of the animal was made to block up nearly the entire width of the by-lane you dare not murder me cried torrens my daughters will escape and he attempted to pass in front of the horse but by a skilful manoeuvre rainford baffled him arrested his progress and kept him at bay using all the time the most desperate menaces which he did not however entertain the remotest idea of putting into execution mr curtis sir will you help me cried the infuriate father my daughters are escaping before your very eyes you are losing your bride and you the rest of the money that was to have purchased her said rainford coolly mercenary old man you are rightly punished with these words the highwayman suddenly wheeled his horse round and disappeared in a moment he had succeeded in barring the way for upwards of ten minutes against the pursuers of the two fugitive ladies and he calculated that in less than half that time they must have reached the post-chaise which clarence villiers had in readiness to receive them jeffreys had purposely delayed getting the horses out and even when he did appear with them several minutes had elapsed since the highwayman had left the path free to those who thought fit to avail themselves of the services of the animals these were only two mr torrens and jeffreys himself the latter volunteering his aid for the purpose of misleading and embarrassing the father rather than of assisting him frank curtis affected to be suddenly taken very unwell sir christopher was really so and the lawyer although by no means a coward did not see any utility in hazarding his life against such a desperate character as captain sparks for by that denomination only did he know tom rain appeared to be thus while the knight his nephew and the attorney retraced their steps to the cottage leading back the horses which had been brought out for their use mr torrens and jeffreys galloped away towards london end of section thirteen section fourteen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lucia kelly melbourne victoria australia the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section fourteen chapter fourteen lady hatfield and dr lascelles esther de medina two days after the incidents which we have just related dr lascelles received a message at about noon requesting him to repair immediately to the dwelling of lady hatfield who was seriously indisposed he obeyed this summons with more than usual alacrity for ever since lord ellingham had made him his confidant the curiosity of the worthy doctor had been strangely piqued by the unaccountable fact that lady hatfield should reject the suit of a man whom she not only professed to love but who was in every way worthy of her on his arrival at lady hatfield's residence he was surprised to learn from miss mordaunt that his patient was too unwell to quit her couch and when he was introduced into georgiana's bedchamber he found her labouring under a strong nervous excitement in accordance with the sacred privilege of the physician he was of course left alone with her ladyship and seating himself by the side of the bed he questioned her in the usual manner georgiana explained her sensations 
but although she alluded to nothing beyond those physical details which directly came within the province of the medical man still dr lascelles had no difficulty in perceiving that the mind rather than the body was affected my dear lady hatfield he said in a gentle and milder tone as he could possibly assume it is in the power of the physician to administer certain drugs which may produce temporary composure and an opiate will encourage a good night's rest but you will forgive me for observing that the condition in which i now find you is scarcely one of which medical science will apply successfully unless seconded by aid of a more refined and delicate nature i do not comprehend you doctor exclaimed georgiana casting upon him a glance of mingled surprise and uneasiness i mean lady hatfield resumed lascelles that you are the prey to some secret grief some source of vexation and annoyance which medical skill cannot remove the aid of a refined and delicate nature to which i refer is such as can be afforded only by a sincere and confidential friend without for an instant seeking to draw you into any explanation it is my duty to assure you that unless your mind be tranquillized medicine will not successfully encounter this nervous irritability this intense anxiety this oppressive feeling of coming evil without apparent cause and this sleeplessness at night of all which you complain i thank you most sincerely for this candour and frankness on your part doctor said lady hatfield after a long pause during which she appeared to reflect profoundly to deny that i have suffered much in mind during the last few days were to practise a useless deception upon you but i require no confidant i need not the solace of friendship to your medical skill i trust for at all events a partial restoration to health and travelling change of scene the excitement of visiting paris or some such means of diversion will affect the rest these last words however accompanied with a deep sigh as if upon the lady's soul were forced the sad conviction that happiness and herself must evermore remain strangers to each other i should scarcely recommend travelling in the winter time lady hatfield observed dr lascelles surely our own city can afford that constant variety of recreation and those ever-changing scenes of amusement which may produce a beneficial effect upon your spirits i abhor the pleasures of the fashionable world doctor said georgiana emphatically there is something so cold in the ostentation of that sphere so chilling in its magnificence so formal in its pursuits so ceremonial so thoroughly artificial in all its features and proceedings that when in the crowded ballroom or the brilliant soiree i even feel more alone than when in the solitude of my own chamber and yet lady hatfield throughout the extensive circle of your acquaintance said the physician there must be at least a few endowed with intellectual qualifications adapted to render them agreeable the most pleasant parties composed of these select might be given your rank your wealth your own well-restored mind and pardon me your beauty would ensure you to oh doctor exclaimed georgiana i can anticipate the arguments that you are about to use but alas my mind appears to be in that morbid state which discolours all objects with its own jaundiced thoughts i speak thus candidly to you doctor because i am aware of your friendship for me i know also that the admission i have now made 
will be regarded by you as a solemn secret and perhaps your advice she added slowly and hesitatingly might prove beneficial to me but no no she exclaimed her utterance suddenly assuming great rapidity it is useless to say more advice cannot serve me there is scarcely a possible cause of human vexation grief or annoyance which cannot be relieved by the solace or ameloriated by the counsel of a friend observed dr lassells dwelling emphatically upon his words georgiana played abstractedly with the long luxuriant hair which streamed over her shoulders and spread its shining masses on the white pillow but at the same time the snowy white dress rose and sank rapidly with the heaving of her bosom believe me lady hatfield continued dr lassells after a short pause during which he vainly awaited a reply to his former observation i am deeply grieved to find that one so little deserves the sting of grief or the presence of misfortune should suffer from either the sharpness of the first or the menaces of the latter but it is not possible my dear lady and now forgive me if i avail myself of the privilege of a physician to ask this question but is it not possible i say that you have conjured up phantoms which have no substantial existence remember that there are certain conditions of the mind when the imagination becomes a prey to the wildest delusions doctor i am no monomaniac said lady hatfield abruptly but justly indeed oh most justly and truly did you here now assert that i little deserve the sting of grief if through any crime any weakness any frailty on my part i had merited the sore displeasure of heaven at that time she checked herself abruptly and burst into a flood of tears and for a few moments her countenance appeared to be the sad index of a breaking heart <sighs> doctor she observed at length pardon this manifestation of weakness on my part but my spirits are so depressed my mind feels so truly wretched that i cannot control these tears think no more of what we have been saying i wish that we had not said so much <sighs> leave me a prescription and visit me again in the course of the day lassells wrote out a prescription and then took his departure wondering more than ever what secret cause of grief was nourished in the bosom of lady hatfield that this secret grief was the motive which had induced or compelled her to refuse the hand of lord ellingham he could not doubt that it arose from no crime weakness or frailty on her part he felt assured inasmuch as her own words uttered in a paradoxium of mental anguish and not in a calm moment when deception might be her aim proved that fact and that it was associated with any physical ailment he could hardly believe because if she were the prey to an insidious disease no feeling of shame no false delicacy could possibly force a woman of her good sense and naturally powerful mind to keep such a fact from her physician what then could be that secret and profoundly rooted cause of grief was it monomania of some novel or very rare kind the curiosity of the man of science was keenly whetted he already began to suspect that he was destined to discover some new phase in the constitution of the human mind and he resolved to adopt all the means within his reach to solve the mystery this curiosity on his part was by no means of a common vulgar or base nature considering the profession and the researchful disposition of the man it was a legitimate and entirely venial sentiment it was not that curiosity which loves to feed itself upon the materials of scandal it was purely in connection with the thirst of knowledge and the passion for discovery which ever animated him in that sphere of science to which he was so enthusiastically devoted the doctor proceeded homewards when he encountered lord ellingham 
the earl was walking by the side of an elderly gentleman on whose arms hung a tall and graceful young lady but the physician did not immediately catch a glimpse of her countenance as it was turned towards lord ellingham who was speaking at that moment the nobleman shook lassels warmly by the hand and immediately introduced his companions by the names of mr and mrs de medina the doctor bowed and then cast a glance at the countenance of the young lady but he started as if with a sudden pang for in the beautiful jewess who now stood before him he beheld apparently past all possibility of error the same female who a few days previously had attempted self-destruction in south Moulton street but almost simultaneously as this unexpected conviction the solemn promise which he had made to tom rainford whom he only knew on that occasion by the denomination of jameson flashed to the memory of dr lassells and instantly composing himself he uttered some observation of a general nature i am glad we have thus met doctor said lord ellingham who had not noticed his sudden but evanescent excitement for my friend mr de medina is a comparative stranger in london and it is as well added the nobleman with a smile that he should become acquainted with the leading physician of the day i believe that no one enjoys health so good as to be enabled to dispense altogether with our assistance said the physician bowing in acknowledgment of the compliment thus paid him the most perfect piece of mechanism must necessarily need repair sometimes decidedly so said lord ellingham but we will not assert that physicians are necessary evils doctor in the same sense as the lawyers are i appeal to miss de medina whether his lordship be not by implication too hard upon my profession exclaimed lassells laughing his lordship replied esther was yesterday riding a very high spirited horse and had he been drawn in uh, such a manner as to incur injury i question whether he would have believed that his medical attendant was an evil however necessary i owe you my profound gratitude for this powerful defence of my profession miss de medina said the doctor who had thus succeeded in compelling the young lady to speak he then raised his hat and passed on but he did not proceed many paces when he was overtaken by lord ellingham who had parted from his companions to have a few minutes conversation with the doctor that is a lovely girl to whom your lordship has just introduced me said lassells and as good in heart as she is beautiful in person exclaimed the nobleman ah cried the physician with a sly glance is lady hatfield already forgotten far from it said arthur his tone instantly becoming mournful and his countenance overclouded you cannot think me so fickle so vacillating doctor no the image of georgiana is never absent from my memory i had only encountered mr de medina and his daughter a few minutes before we met you and not only am i bound to show them every attention in my power as they are tenants of mine and were strongly recommended to me by mutual friends at liverpool but also i am glad to court intellectual society wherever it can be found in this city to distract my mind from the one topic which so constantly and so painfully engrosses it ah mr de medina and his daughter such very agreeable companions inquired lassells apparently in quite a casual manner mr de medina is a well-informed intelligent and even erudite man answered the earl his daughter is highly accomplished sensible and amiable i feel an additional interest in them because they belong to a race whom it is the fashion to revile and often despise it is true that my acquaintance with mr de medina and his daughter scarcely dates from a month back but i have already seen and if not i have heard enough to know that he is the pattern of integrity and the young lady the personification of every virtue the doctor made no reply certain was he that he could a tale unfold which would totally undeceive his noble friend relative to the character of esther but his lips were sealed by a solemn vow and even if they were not there was no necessity to detail how he had been summoned to attend on the young lady and rescue her from the fate and crime of suicide how he had good cause to know that she was either a wife 
or a mistress but he suspected the latter how he had seen that splendid form stretched half naked upon the bed the bosom heaving convulsively with physical and mental agony and the exquisitely modelled arms flung wildly about with excruciating pain how the large black eyes had been fixed imploringly upon him and the vermilion lips had parted to give utterance to words demanding from himself the fiat of her life or death there was no necessity we say to narrate all this even if no vow had bound him to silence because lord ellingham sought not that lovely jewess as a wife that esther de medina and the lady of south moulton street were one and the same person the doctor felt convinced the tones of esther's voice flowing upon the ear with such silver melody the two rows of brilliant beautiful teeth the face the hair the eyes the configuration of the form with its fine but justly proportioned bust and slender waist all were identical but what chiefly amazed nay bewildered the physician was the calm indifference with which esther met his rapid searching glance the admirable composure with which she had encountered him the firmness amounting almost to an insolent assurance with which she had spoken to him never once quailing nor blushing nor manifesting the slightest embarrassment but actually treating him as a person whom she had saw for the first time and as if he were totally unacquainted with anything that mitigated against her character all this was naturally a subject of ineffable astonishment and wonder lord ellingham accompanied the doctor to grafton street and when they had entered the house dr lassells made him acquainted with lady hatfield's indisposition she is ill ejaculated arthur profoundly touched by these tidings and i dare not call even to inquire concerning her and wherefore should you not manifest that courtesy asked the doctor i must forget her i cannot demonstrate any farther interest on her behalf exclaimed the nobleman if there really exist reasons which render it impossible or imprudent for her to change her condition by marriage it is useless for us to meet again and if she be swayed by caprice i cannot suffer myself to be made the sport of her whims there are the wanton wilful whims of a coquette said the doctor impressively and there are the delusions of the monomaniac but the latter are not the less conscientiously believed although they be nothing save delusions is it possible cried arthur a sudden ray of hope breaking in upon him can georgiana be subject to fantasies of that nature oh that she could be cured doctor and your skill may yet make us happy rest assured my dear earl was the reply that all the knowledge which i possess shall be devoted to that purpose my eternal gratitude will be due to you doctor said the nobleman with your permission i shall return in the evening to learn from you how our charming patient progresses the physician signified his assent and lord ellingham took his departure new hopes animating his soul end of section fourteen recording by lucia kelly melbourne victoria australia Section 15 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Scott Kelly. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Opiate. It was about seven o'clock in the evening when Dr. Lascelles returned to Lady Hatfield's house on Piccadilly Hill. Miss Mordaunt, whom he encountered in the drawing room, informed him that Georgina had become more composed and tranquil since she had taken the medicine which he had prescribed for her, and that she had requested to be left alone as she experienced an inclination to sleep. It is nevertheless necessary that I should see her, said the physician. Julia accordingly hastened to her friend's apartment and speedily returned with the information 
that Lady Hatfield was not yet asleep, and that the doctor might walk up. Lascelles immediately availed himself of this permission, but he found, as indeed he had fully anticipated, that his patient was rapidly yielding to the invisible drowsiness produced by the opiate medicine which he had prescribed for her. He seated himself by the bedside, asked her for a few ordinary questions, and then suffered her to fall undisturbed into slumber. At length, she slept profoundly. A smile of satisfaction played for a moment upon the lips of the physician, but it yielded to a somber cloud, which almost immediately succeeded it, for a powerful struggle now suddenly arose in the breast of Dr. Lascelles. In his ardent devotion to the science which he professed, he longed to satisfy himself on certain points at present admitting of doubt and involved in uncertainty, and, on the other hand, he hesitated at the accomplishment of a deed which he could not help regarding as a gross abuse of his privileges as a medical man. By virtue of the most sacred confidence, he was admitted to the bedchamber of his female patient, and he shrank from exercising that right in an illegitimate way. Then again, he reasoned to himself that if he were enabled to ascertain beyond all doubt that no physical cause induced Lady Hatfield to shrink from marriage, he must fall back upon the theory that she had become subject to certain monomaniac notions which influenced her mind to her own unhappiness, and he at length persuaded himself that he should be acting for her best interests, were he to put into execution the project which he had already formed. Such an opinion, operating upon a man who possessed but few of the delicate and refined feelings of our nature, and who was ever ready to sacrifice all considerations to the cause of the medical science, speedily banished hesitation. Having convinced himself that Georgina slept so profoundly that there was no chance of awaking her, he locked the door and again approached the bed. And now his sacrilegious hand drew aside the snow-white dress which covered the sleeping lady's bosom, and the treasures of that gently heaving breast were exposed to his view. But not a sensual thought was thereby excited in his mind. Cold and passionless, he surveyed the beauteous spectacle only as a sculptor might measure the proportions of a marble Venus or Diana the Huntress. And not a trace of cancer was there. No unseemly mark, nor mole, nor scar, nor wound disfigured the glowing orbs that, rising from a broad and ample chest, swelled laterally over the upper part of the arms. Yet wherefore did Dr. Lascelles abruptly start? And why did his countenance suddenly assume an expression of surprise, or rather a mingled doubt of astonishment, as his glances wandered over the fair bust thus exposed to his view? Carefully and cautiously refastening the strings of the nightdress, he now assumed the air of a man who had discovered some clue to a mystery her thirto profoundly veiled. And unhesitatingly did he resolve to clear up all his doubts and all his newly awakened suspicions. Five minutes afterwards, Dr. Lascelles left the room, Lady Hatfield still remaining buried in deep slumber. His countenance expressed surprise, mingled with sorrow and cold. Phlegmatic through his disposition was, he could not help murmuring to himself, Is this possible? Having just looked into the drawing room to take leave of Miss Mordaunt and state that his patient was progressing as favorably as could be expected, Dr. Lascelles returned home. Lord Ellingham was waiting for him in this interview the physician now dreaded. 
Are your tidings favorable, doctor? Was the nobleman's hasty and anxious inquiry. I regret, my dear Earl, answered Lascelles, that I should have encouraged hopes which are doomed to experience disappointment, added Arthur bitterly. Oh, I might have anticipated this, unfortunate being that I am. But how have you ascertained that your ideas of this morning are unfounded? How have you convinced yourself that your Gina is not a prey to these mental eccentricities which your skill might reach? Has she revealed to you her motive for refusing, for rejecting me, me, whom she professes to love? She has revealed nothing, my lord, replied the doctor solemnly. But I have satisfied myself that monomania and Lady Hatfield are total strangers to each other. Then must I abandon all hope, exclaimed the earl, for it is evident that I am the victim of a ridiculous caprice. And yet, he added, a sudden thought striking him, I will see her once again. She is ill. She is suffering. Perhaps she will be pleased to behold me. And who knows? Not this evening, my lord. Not this evening, cried the doctor, stopping the nobleman who had seized his hat and was darting towards the door. Lady Hatfield sleeps, and she must not be disturbed. But Lord Ellingham was too full of his new idea to pay any attention to the physician, and he rushed from the house. End of section 15. Recorded by Scott Kelly. Section 16 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 16 The Lover and the Uncle. A few minutes brought Arthur to the residence of Lady Hatfield, and his hand was already upon the knocker when a sudden idea struck him, and he asked himself, How can I demand admission to the bedchamber of Georgiana? The madness of his project now being evident to him, he mournfully turned away when the door suddenly opened, and a tall, stout, fine-looking man, dressed as a country squire, issued from the house. Lord Ellingham, immediately recognized sir ralph walsingham georgiana's uncle with whom he was well acquainted the baronet also perceived the earl and they shook each other cordially by the hand were you about to call inquired sir ralph i was answered lord ellingham hearing of lady hatfield's illness she is better much better interrupted the baronet i have just left her and she has not long awoke from a profound and refreshing slumber i am delighted to hear these tidings said the nobleman the servant seeing that sir ralph had stopped to converse with the earl still kept the door open and as arthur had admitted that he was about to call there was now no alternative save for him to leave his card the baronet then took his arm and they walked away together georgiana is a singular being observed sir ralph and although she is my niece yet there are times when i hardly know what to make of her she is too intellectual too steady to be capricious and still my dear sir ralph interrupted the earl you have touched upon the very topic concerning which i longed to speak the moment i met you will you accompany me to my abode and favour me for a short period with your attention to what i am so anxious to confide to you with pleasure was the reply but i have already learnt from georgiana's lips the principal fact to which your lordship doubtless alludes and it was indeed for the purpose of introducing the subject that i ere now made the remark relative to the occasional incomprehensibility of her character let us not however continue the discourse in the public street 
the nobleman and the baronet speedily reached the mansion of the former in pall mall west and when they were seated in an elegantly furnished apartment with a bottle of claret before them they renewed the conversation georgiana said the baronet has informed me that your lordship has honoured her by the offer of your hand and i need hardly assure you how rejoiced i should feel to welcome as a relative one whom i already esteem as a friend but to my inexpressible surprise i find that 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 she has refused me exclaimed the earl refused me without assigning any reason i cannot think how it is to be accounted for continued the baronet but georgiana has invariably manifested a repugnance to the topic of marriage whenever i have urged it upon her of course as her uncle and double her age my lord i can give her advice just as if i were her father and for some years past i had recommended her to consider well the propriety of obtaining a legal protector her natural ones being no more but all my reasoning has proved unavailing and if your lordship cannot persuade my obstinate niece he added with a sly laugh then no one must hope to do so i will frankly admit to you said the earl that my happiness depends on your niece's decision i am no hero of romance but i entertain so sincere so ardent an affection for lady hatfield that my life will be embittered by a perseverance in her refusal to allow me to call her mine she will not persist in this folly she cannot exclaimed sir ralph emphatically it is a mere whim a caprice and indeed i have often thought that her disposition has somewhat altered ever since a dreadful fright which she sustained six or seven years ago ah said the earl what was the nature of the incident to which you allude i must tell your lordship returned the baronet unless indeed you are already acquainted with the fact that hampshire was for three or four years between eighteen eighteen and eighteen twenty one or twenty two the scene of the exploits of a celebrated highwayman you allude to the black mask no doubt interrupted lord ellingham interrogatively precisely so answered the baronet the black mask as the villain was called was one of the most desperate robbers that ever infested the highways he would stop the stage-coach as readily as he would a single traveller on horseback and such was his valour as well as his extraordinary skill that he defied all attempts to capture him i remember reading his exploits at the time said the earl the most conflicting accounts were reported concerning him some declared he was an old man others that he was quite young but i believe that all agreed in ascribing to him a more forbearing disposition than usually characterizes persons of his class i will even go so far as to assert that there was something chivalrous in his character exclaimed the baronet he invariably assured travellers whom he stopped that he should be grieved to harm them but that if they provoked him by resistance he would not hesitate to punish them severely if he fell in with a carriage containing ladies he never attempted to rifle them of their jewellery and trinkets but contented himself with simply demanding their purses those being surrendered he would gallop away i never heard of any unnecessary violence nor of any act of cruelty which he perpetrated neither did i ever meet a soul who could give anything like a credible description of his countenance the invariable black mask which concealed his features and from the use of which he derived his name seemed a portion of himself and although gossips did now and then tell strange tales about his appearance they were all too contradictory to allow a scintillation of the real truth to transpire 
but in what manner was the black mass connected with the fright which lady hatfield experienced some years ago asked the earl impatiently you are perhaps aware that the late earl and countess of mauleverer possessed a country seat between winchester and new alresford not very far distant from walsingham manor my own rural abode said sir ralph it must have been seven years ago that georgiana who always preferred mauleverer lodge to the town mansion even during the london season was staying alone there i mean so far alone that at the time there were no other persons at the lodge save the servants well one night the black mask broke into the place the only time he was ever known to commit a burglary and such was the fright which georgiana experienced that for weeks and months afterwards her family frequently trembled lest her reason had received a shock it must indeed have been an alarming situation for a young lady alone as it were in a spacious and secluded country dwelling and georgiana was but eighteen i think at the time interrupted sir ralph walsingham she certainly experienced a dreadful fright and although thank god her reason is as unimpaired as ever it was still we cannot say that the sudden shock might not have produced some strange effect which may probably account for the otherwise inexplicable whimsicality for i can denominate it nothing else oh i thank you my dear sir ralph for this explanation cried lord ellingham in the joy of reviving hope yes i see it all your niece experienced a shock which has produced a species of idiosyncratic effect upon her but the constant kindness the unwearied attention of one who loves her and whom she loves in return will restore her mind to its vigorous and healthy condition to-morrow will i visit her again oh how unkind how ungenerous of me to remain away so long there was a pause during which arthur gave way to all the bright allurements of the pleasing vision which he now conjured up to his imagination at length sir ralph walsingham felt the silence to be irksome and awkward and he ventured to break it we were talking just now my lord he said of the famous highwayman known as the black mask he disappeared from hampshire very suddenly and the old women declared that his time being out he was carried off by the devil who had protected him against all the devices and snares imagined by the authorities to capture him and perhaps the highwayman who robbed lady hatfield the other day observed lord ellingham may be the very one who rendered himself so notorious in hampshire a few years ago your lordship judges by the fact that the scoundrel who stopped my niece near hounslow wore a black mask said the baronet but the generality of robbers on the high roads adopt that mode of disguise thank heaven public depredators of the kind are becoming very scarce in this country in such conversation did the nobleman and the baronet while away the time until eleven o'clock when the latter took his leave and arthur retired to his chamber to dream of the charming but incomprehensible lady who had obtained such empire over his soul end of section sixteen section seventeen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter seventeen the mysterious letter jacob on the same evening that the interview between the earl of ellingham and sir ralph walsingham took place as narrated in the preceding chapter the following scene occurred at the house of toby bunce in earl street seven dials 
mrs bunce was alone in the dirty dingy back room which could not be said to be lighted but merely redeemed from total darkness by the solitary candle that stood on the table and she was busily employed in lighting the fire having succeeded in this object she placed the kettle on the grate to boil and then took from a cupboard a bottle half full of gin two common blue mugs a broken basin containing a little lump sugar and a couple of pewter spoons all of which articles she ranged around the brass candlestick with a view to make as good a show as possible then she seated herself by the fire and consulted an old silver watch which she drew from her pocket and which was in reality the property of her husband whom she would not however trust with it under any consideration eight o'clock she said aloud in a musing tone he can't be very long now and toby won't be in till ten if he is i'll send him out again with a flea in his ear she added chuckling at the idea of her supremacy in her own domestic sphere i wonder who'd be ruled by a feller like toby not me indeed i should think not but i wish old bones would come she continued with a glance of satisfaction at the table everything does look so comfortable and i've put em in such a manner that the light falls on em all at once toby never would have thought of that it's only us women that know what tidiness is tidiness indeed the windows were dingy with dirt the walls were begrimed with smoke and dust the floor was as black as the deck of a collier and the cobwebs hung like filthy rags in the corners of the room scarcely had mrs bunce completed her survey of the place and its arrangements when a low knock summoned her to the street door and in a few moments she returned accompanied by old death the hideous man was very cold and seating himself as near the fire as possible without actually burning his knees he said now betsy my dear brew me a mug of something cheering as soon as possible that i will ben returned mrs bunce in as pleasant a tone of voice as she could assume then she bustled about with great alacrity until the steaming liquid was duly compounded and old death had expressed his satisfaction by means of a short grunt after the first sip is it nice ben asked mrs bunce endearingly very now make yourself some betsy and sit down quietly for we must have a talk about you know what business has prevented me from attending to it before but now that i have got an evening to spare and toby is out of the way oh you know very well ben interrupted mrs bunce that i can always manage him as i like he's such a fool and so completely under my thumb that i shouldn't even mind telling him i'd been your mistress for years before i was his wife keep your tongue quiet betsy keep your tongue quiet exclaimed old death with a hyena like growl never provoke irritation unnecessarily but let's to business jacob is out on the watch after tom rain and i told the lad to come up here before ten and now about this letter he continued drawing one from his pocket-book it proves you see that the child is well born and if the address had only been written on the outside we might make a good thing of the matter just so observed mrs bunce when mr rainford called this afternoon he was so particular in asking me whether i had found any papers about the woman's clothes but i declared i had not and he was quite satisfied he paid me too very handsome for the funeral expenses and all my trouble if he was to know about that letter ben how can he know exclaimed old death impatiently now what i think he continued in a milder tone is just this the woman watts was reduced to such a desperate state of poverty that she wrote this letter to the mother of the boy charles why of course interrupted mrs bunce she says as much in the letter will you listen to me growled old death angrily you don't know what i was going to observe don't be cross ben i won't stop you again said the woman in a coaxing tone 
mind you don't then ejaculated bones allowing himself to be pacified well this sarah watts wrote that letter as i was saying with the intention of sending it no doubt either by post or by an acquaintance to the lady in london i think that is plain enough then when she had finished writing it something evidently made her change her mind and resolve on coming up to london herself this is also plain because if it wasn't so why did the letter never go and why did she come to london how well you do talk ben said mrs bunce i talk to the point i hope observed old death now how stands the matter here is a very important letter wanting two main things to render it completely valuable to us the first thing it wants is the name of the place from which it would have been dated had it ever been sent and the second thing it wants is the name of the lady to whom it was intended to be sent in a word it wants the address of the writer and the address of the lady to whom it was written and who is the mother of that boy charles what good would it do you to have the address of the writer since she is dead and buried asked mrs bunce because i could then visit the place where the woman was when she wrote this letter replied old death i could make inquiries concerning the late sarah watts and i know too well how to put two and two together not to arrive at some certainty in the long run to be sure ejaculated mrs bunce how clever you are dear ben i don't know about being clever betsy my dear returned the hideous old man but this i do think that i'm rather wide awake and then he chuckled so heartily while his toothless jaws wagged up and down so horribly that he appeared to be a corpse under a process of galvanism for if a dead body could be made to utter sounds they would not be more sepulchral than those which now emanated from the throat of old death mrs bunce considered it to be her duty to chuckle also and her querulous tone seemed a humble accompaniment to the guttural sounds which we have attempted to describe at length the chuckling ceased on both sides and mrs bunce replenished the mugs with hot gin and water but even as it is suddenly observed old death after a hasty glance at the letter which he now slowly folded up and returned to his greasy pocket-book but even as it is we may still make something of the business if we could only find a clue to the mother of that boy it would be a fortune in itself i tell you what we must do he exclaimed emphatically what asked his ancient mistress get that boy into our own keeping replied bones with a sly smile and then we can pump him of all he may happen to know concerning the deceased sarah watts excellent cried mrs bunce clapping her hands but how will you find out where mr rainford lives jacob is after him for several reasons i want to know as much as i can about that strange fellow the very day that i made the bargain with him about smashing all the flimsies he might bring me he wrote an extraordinary note to the very lady whom he had robbed the night before and he made her go into the witness-box at bow street and deliberately perjure herself to serve him then he starts off to pell-mell when the jewess prisoner was brought up and delivers a note at the house of lord ellingham and lord ellingham comes straight down to the police court and swears black and blue that the jewess is innocent and was she asked mrs bunce that's more than i can say answered old death seeing that i know nothing at all about the affair well these two strange things showing an extraordinary influence on the part of rainford over lady hatfield on the one side and lord ellingham on the other have quite puzzled me he is an enigma that i must solve does not tullock know all about him demanded mrs bunce tullock knows only that tom took to the road some years ago down in the country for tullock then did at winchester just what i do now in london 
only added bones with a knowing glance and a compressed smile of the lips which puckered up his hideous face into one unvaried mass of wrinkles only my dear betsy tullock never had the connection which i have he had no correspondent at hamburg to whom he could send over the notes that are stolen and stopped at the bank he had no well contrived places to receive goods places continued old death emphatically which have baffled the police for thirty years and will baffle them as long again if i live and why should you not dear said mrs bunce coaxingly because i cannot expect it replied old death abruptly however you know what i have done for myself and in what way i manage my business you only betsy dear are acquainted with my secrets and you are as safe with me as if i was deaf and dumb and unable to write rejoined the woman i know that i know that said bones hastily then in a slower tone he added significantly because if there was a smash we should all go together betsy lor ben don't talk in that way don't cried mrs bunce let's see what were we saying oh you was telling me about mr rainford i was only observing that tullock lost sight of him for some years and knows nothing that happened to him till he turned up in london the other day i don't suppose rainford is his proper name observed the woman inquiringly tullock never told me answered bones and as he and tom are thick together i can't ask him too many questions the fact is rainford will prove the most useful man i ever had in my service as i may call it and i must not risk offending him see how neatly he did that job the other night how beautifully he came off with the two thousand and it never got into the papers either observed mrs bunce not a bit of it cried old death with another chuckle tom calculated all that beforehand or he never would have been fool enough to go so quietly and introduce himself as captain sparks to the very people he meant to rob ha ha clear-headed fellow that tom he first ascertained the precise character of all the parties concerned and he knew that he might plunder them with impunity sir christopher and mr torrens were sure not to talk about it for fear of the whole disgraceful story about the purchase of the daughter coming out frank curtis is a cowardly boaster who would not like it to be known that a single highwayman had mastered him the lawyer was sure to speak or hold his tongue just as his rich client sir christopher ordered him and jeffreys was safe tom weighed all this and boldly introduced himself to them without the least attempt at disguising his person oh it was capitally managed and tom is a valuable fellow mr bones seldom spoke so long at a time but he was carried away by his enthusiastic admiration of tom rainford and he accordingly talked himself so effectually out of breath that a fit of coughing supervened and he was nearly choked betsy however slapped him on the back and the old man gradually recovered himself but not before his fierce-looking eyes were dimmed with the scalding room which overflowed them you are afraid to offend mr rainford said mrs bunce after a pause and yet you think of taking away that boy from him pshaw cried old death whom the coughing fit had put into a bad humour do you think i should steal the child and then tell him of it of course not said mrs bunce i am a fool you are indeed betsy rejoined old death and yet you are the least foolish woman i ever knew or else i never should have made you my confidant as i have done and now i tell you betsy that i have many great schemes in my head and i shall require your assistance in the first place we must get hold of that boy charlie somehow or another provided we can find out rainford's abode which i think is scarcely doubtful then we must act upon all the information we can glean from the child and find out who his mother really is in the next place i must ascertain all i can concerning this jewess this esther de medina if she did steal the diamonds she is the cleverest female thief in all england for she has managed to get clean off with her prize and such a woman would be invaluable to me besides if she pursues the same game supposing that she has really begun it she will want my assistance to dispose of the property 
and she will gladly listen to my overtures such a beautiful creature as i understand she is could insinuate herself anywhere and rob the best houses in london ah betsy i must not sleep over these matters but hark that's jacob's knock poor jacob cried mrs bunce with a subdued sigh if he only knew silence woman cried bones in a furious manner go to the door mrs bunce was frightened by the vehemence of old death's manner and hastened to obey his command in a few moments she returned followed by jacob who seemed sinking with fatigue well said old death impatiently what news give me something to eat first for i'm famished cried jacob throwing himself upon a chair not a morsel to you tell me what you have done exclaimed bones angrily as he rose from his seat i will not speak a word on that subject before i have had food said jacob his bright eyes flashing fire and a hectic glow appearing on his pale cheeks you make me wander about all day on your business without a penny in my pocket to buy a piece of bread because he who has to earn his supper works all the better for it ejaculated bones his lips quivering with rage now speak jacob or by god you shan't bully me in this way cried the lad bursting into tears and yet with all the evidences of intense passion working upon his countenance by what right do you treat me like a dog you fling me a bone when you choose and you think i will lick your hand like a spaniel i tell you once for all i won't put up with it any longer you won't jacob you won't eh said old death in a very low tone but at the same time he dealt the lad such a sudden and severe box on the ears that the poor youth was hurled heavily from his chair on the hard floor but springing up in a moment he flew like a tiger at old death whose small amount of strength was exhausted by the effort which it had required on the part of so aged a man to deal such a blow and jacob would have mastered him in another instant had not mrs bunce interfered with a loud scream she precipitated herself on the lad and seizing him in her bony arms forced him back into his seat saying there jacob for god's sake be quiet and i'll give you something nice directly the lad made no reply but darted a look of vindictive hate towards old death who had sunk back exhausted on the chair which he had ere now quitted then mrs bunce hastened to the cupboard and produced a loaf and the remains of a cold joint which she placed before jacob who enraged as he was at the treatment he had just received could not help wondering within himself how toby's wife had become so liberal as to place the viands without reserve at his disposal the woman seemed to penetrate his thoughts for she said eat as much as you like jacob don't be afraid i shan't mind if you eat it nearly all the lad smothered his resentment so far as not to permit it to interfere with his appetite and he devoured his supper without once glancing towards old death who on his side appeared unable to recover from the surprise into which jacob's unusually rebellious conduct had thrown him a profound silence reigned in that room for several minutes at length jacob made an end of his meal and then old death spoke and so this is the reward he said which i receive for all my kindness towards you without me what would have become of you deserted by your parents a foundling a miserable infant abandoned to the tender mercies of the workhouse authorities would that i had died then interrupted jacob emphatically you make a boast of having taken care of me of having reared me such a rearing as it has been and yet i wish you had left me to perish on the workhouse steps where you say you found me i have tried to be obedient to you i have done all i could to please you but do you ever utter a kind word to me even when i succeed in doing your bidding what reward is mine blows reproaches sorry meals few and far between well well jacob i think i have not quite done my duty towards you said old death who in reality could have murdered the boy at that moment but who was compelled to adopt a conciliatory tone and manner in order to retain so useful an auxiliary in his service but let us say no more about it 
and things shall be better in future instead of having no regular place of abode and sleeping in lodging-houses you shall have half a crown a week jacob to hire a little room for yourself there jacob only think of that cried mrs bunce in a tone expressive of high approval of this munificence on the part of old death and you shall have threepence every day for your dinner jacob continued bones in addition to your breakfast and tea which you always get here but will you keep to that arrangement asked the lad considerably softened by this prospect which was far brighter than any he had as yet beheld i will i will replied old death and if you have brought me any good news to-night i'll give you ten shillings ten whole shillings jacob to buy some nice clothes and shoes in monmouth street put down the money cried jacob now completely won back to the interests of the crafty old villain who knew so well how to curb the evanescent spirit of his miserable slave i will said bones and he laid four half-crowns upon the table that's right exclaimed jacob his eyes glistening with delight at the prospect of fingering such a treasure then he glanced rapidly at his ragged apparel with a smile on his lip that expressed his conviction of shortly being able to procure a more comfortable attire go on said old death what have you done when mr rainford went away from here this afternoon returned jacob i followed him at a good distance but not so far off that i stood a chance of losing sight of him well first he went to tullock's and there he stayed some little time then he walked into an eating-house in the strand and at that place he stopped about a couple of hours while i walked up and down the other side of the way at length he came out with another gentleman what was he like demanded old death a fine tall handsome man with dark hair and eyes responded jacob i don't know him said bones never mind go on with your story and let it be as short as possible well continued the lad this gentleman and mr rainford walked together as far as bridge street blackfriars and there they parted the gentleman went into a house in bridge street and mr rainford crossed the bridge it was now getting dusk and i was obliged to keep closer to him but he seldom turned round and when he did i took good care he should not see me so on he went till he came to the elephant and castle and close by there he suddenly met a lady with a dark veil over her face and holding a little boy by the hand they stood and talked for a moment just opposite a shop window which was lighted up and i saw well enough that the little boy was the very same that was brought here the other night by the woman who was buried so quietly this morning then we know that the boy is still in his care ejaculated old death exchanging significant glances with mrs bunce go on jacob i can see that the ten shillings will be yours yes that they will cried the lad apparently having forgotten the blow which he had recently received well so i knew the boy at once though he is much changed nicely dressed and already quite plump and rosy mr rainford patted him on the face and the boy laughed and seemed so happy then mr rainford gave the lady his arm and they walked a little way down the road till they came to a jeweller's shop where they stopped to look in at the window mr rainford pointed out some article to the lady and they went into the shop the lady still holding the little boy carefully by the hand the moment they were safe inside i watched them through the window and i saw mr rainford looking at a pair of earrings in a few moments he handed them to the lady she lifted up her veil to examine them and i knew her again in a moment but who do you think she was old death shook his head no i don't think you ever could guess cried jacob then who is she demanded bones impatiently the jewess who was accused of stealing the diamonds at bow street the other day answered jacob esther de medina cried old death the very person we were speaking about just now he added exchanging another glance with mrs bunce but go on jacob go on i was rather surprised at that discovery continued jacob because i thought it so odd that both mr rainford and the jewess should have been had up on the very same day at bow street on different charges and that both should have got off 
it is strange very strange murmured old death but did you find out tom rain's address that is the chief thing i want to know don't be in a hurry said jacob let me tell my story in my own way well so the jewess seemed to like the earrings and she gave mr rainford such a sweet smile oh what a sweet smile as he pulled out his purse and paid for them i don't know how it was but it really went to my heart to think that such a beautiful lady should never mind what you felt jacob interrupted old death abruptly make an end of your story well the earrings were put into a nice little box with some wool to keep them from rubbing and the lady drew down her veil again before she left the shop now jacob tell me the truth said old death did either tom rain or the jewess take any little thing at a moment you know when the jeweller's back was turned no not a thing cried the lad emphatically i can swear they did not you are quite sure observed old death as sure as that i'm here for i never took my eyes off them from the moment they entered the shop till they came out responded jacob and when they did come out i was very near being seen by mr rainford for i was then in front of them and i had only just time to slip into the shade of the wall between the windows of the jeweller's shop and the next one then i heard mr rainford say to the jewess now this little present is in part a recompense for the diamonds which i made you give up the lady said something in a low tone but i could not catch it and they went on the little boy with them then she did steal the diamonds exclaimed old death but how could such a man as lord ellingham feel any interest in her and how could he have been induced to perjure himself to save her isn't it strange said mrs bunce i'm all in the dark at present returned bones but go on jacob they walked on till they came to a street on the left-hand side and into that street they turned i never lost sight of them once but two or three times i thought mr rainford would have twigged me he did not though and i at last traced them to a house in lock's fields lock's fields eh cried old death can they possibly be living there they are returned jacob and i can take you over to the very street and the very house any time you like well done ejaculated bones indulging in another long and hearty chuckle which was echoed by mrs bunce and then they both rubbed their hands gleefully to think that they had made such important discoveries through the medium of jacob fresh supplies of grog were brewed and the lad was not only permitted to consign the four half-crowns to his pocket but was also regaled with an occasional sip of gin and water from mrs bunce's own mug the return of toby at ten o'clock prevented any further conversation on the interesting topics which had previously been discussed for mrs bunce's husband was not admitted to the entire confidence of his spouse and of mr benjamin bones alias old death End of chapter seventeen section eighteen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds the lovers it was noon and lady hatfield sat alone in her drawing-room she felt herself so much better and dr lascelles had that morning so earnestly recommended her to quit the bedchamber and seek the change of scene which even a removal from one apartment to another ever affords especially to an invalid that she had not hesitated to follow her own inclination and his advice both of which were fully of accord her uncle sir ralph walsingham was announced shortly after lady hatfield had descended to the drawing-room my dear georgiana exclaimed the honest and kind-hearted man as he entered the apartment i am delighted to find you here but why are you alone where is miss mordaunt in the parlour below replied lady hatfield julia has a visitor she added with an arch smile in spite of the melancholy which still oppressed her mind a visitor 
ejaculated the baronet sir christopher blunt i'll be bound you have guessed rightly my dear uncle but how how should i know anything about it interrupted sir ralph surely georgiana you must be too well acquainted with your friend's disposition to suppose that she could have possibly held her tongue relative to the presumed attachment of the worthy knight why all the time she was at the manor did she not absolutely hurl sir christopher's name at every soul whom she could engage in conversation was it not sir christopher had told her this last season and sir christopher had assured her of that and did she not go much farther than merely to hint that sir christopher was dying for her for my part i was sick of sir christopher's name but now i suppose he has come to lay his title and fortune at her feet as the newspapers say or else what could possibly signify a visit at so unseemly an hour as midday it will be an excellent match for julia remarked georgiana by way of saying something she is not one of those who believe that marriage should be only a convention of hearts and not of worldly interests and as lady hatfield made this observation a profound sigh escaped her bosom what means that sigh niece demanded the baronet are you envious of miss mordaunt's worldly mindedness i am convinced you are not by the way i met lord ellingham last evening his lordship left his card said lady hatfield casting down her eyes while her bosom again rose and fell with a long and painfully drawn sigh georgiana exclaimed sir ralph seating himself by the side of his niece and taking her hand in a kind manner your conduct towards that young earl is not just is not generous is not rational oh my dear uncle cried lady hatfield starting wildly for heaven's sake renew not the discussion of last evening pardon me my dear niece said sir ralph affectionately but firmly if i give you pain by referring to the topic of that discussion i am your nearest relation i am a widower and childless you know that my property is extensive and my fond hope has ever been since the death of your aunt lady walsingham that you would marry and that your children should inherit those estates and that fortune which i can bequeath to whomsoever i will but you refuse to accept the hand of a man who is every way worthy of you you reject an alliance which in every human probability would be blessed by a progeny to whom my wealth and yours may alike descend nay interrupt me not dear georgiana i am old enough to be your father i love you as if you were my daughter and i have your welfare deeply at heart to speak frankly i had a long conversation last evening with lord ellingham georgiana's attention was for an instant broken by a wild start of despair my god what signifies this grief georgiana asked her uncle i thought to give you pleasure by the assurance i was about to disclose an assurance which conveys to you the unalterable fidelity of the earl's affection his readiness to bury in oblivion any little whim or caprice which induced you to subject him to the humiliation of a refusal the other day his determination to study your happiness so entirely that any cloud of melancholy or unknown and unfounded presentiment any morbid feeling in a word which hangs upon your mind shall speedily be dissipated such are his generous intentions such are his tender aspirations georgiana can you reject his suit again this appeal made to the unhappy lady by an individual who though only related to her by the fact of having married her mother's sister had still ever manifested towards her the sincerest affection and friendship this appeal we say came with such overwhelming force upon the mind of georgiana that she knew not how to answer it 
you consent georgiana you consent exclaimed sir ralph entirely mistaking the cause of her profound silence and starting up he rushed from the room before her lips could give utterance to a syllable that might have the effect of stopping him merciful god what does he mean to do cried georgiana clasping her hands together while a species of spasmodic shuddering came over her entire frame hasty footsteps approached the door wildly did the unhappy lady glance around her with the terrified and imploring air of one whom the officers of justice were about to fetch to the scaffold the door flew open georgiana averted her eyes but at the next moment her hands were grasped in those of another and warm lips were pressed upon each fair hand of hers and for a single instant there streamed through her whole being the electric warmth of ineffable delight hope and love she sank back upon the sofa whence she had risen her eyes which for a moment had seemed to lose the faculty of sight were involuntarily turned toward the earl of ellingham who was kneeling at her feet and simultaneously her uncle's voice sounding like the knell of destiny upon her ears exclaimed i told you she had consented ellingham be happy for georgiana is yours the door of the apartment was then closed hastily and lady hatfield now knew that she was alone with her lover oh my dearest georgiana murmured arthur still pressing the lady's hands in his own how happy have you at length made me and how can i ever express the joy which animates me at this moment my heart dances wildly with joy and gratitude and all the anguish which i have lately experienced is forgotten as if it never had been indeed my beloved one it is for me to implore your pardon for i should not have remained absent from you so long but now that we are reunited and your indisposition has passed now that your mind has recovered its naturally healthy tone there is nothing my georgiana to interrupt the free course of our felicity lady hatfield was seized with a certain involuntary horror which completely stupefied her as these impassioned exclamations fell upon her ears and vainly vainly did she endeavour to reply arthur rose and seating himself by her side on the sofa passed his arm around her slender waist and drawing her gently towards him said in a subdued tone from this day forth beloved georgiana you must have no secrets unknown to me confide in me as your best and sincerest friend and the tenderest sympathy shall flow from my heart to solace you in those moments of melancholy which no mortal however prosperously placed can hope altogether to avoid in the society of a husband who will never cease to love you whose constant care shall be to ensure your felicity and whose unwearied attention shall be devoted to the promotion of your happiness your life will be spent in an atmosphere into which a cloud shall seldom intrude oh what pictures of perfect bliss present themselves to my imagination the enamoured nobleman pressed the fair one closer to his breast as he thus poured forth his soul with all the ardour of his sincere and devoted love and she in spite of herself bewildered stupefied intoxicated as she was by the suddenness with which this scene had been brought about she gazed with mingled rapture and surprise upon that handsome countenance which the glow of inward passion and ineffable joy now rendered still more expressive she felt as if the hysterical shrieks which for some moments past had threatened to burst from her lips were subdued stifled by some unknown power whose influence was strangely sweet and consoling her soul almost sickened in the bliss of that love by which she was surrounded and to which her woman's heart could not do otherwise than respond 
then again she felt as if she must start from his arms reject his love dash down that chalice of honeyed happiness from which they both were drinking deep draughts and proclaim to him that it was all a hideous mistake that she had never consented to receive him as her husband that her uncle had committed a fearful error and that they must separate never never again to meet but at the very moment when she was about to do all this arthur drew her nearer to him his breath sweet as that of flowers fell on her burning cheek his hand pressed hers she found herself linked to him in heart by a spell which no mortal courage could at such a moment have broken then she caught herself looking into his fine eyes and reading the thrilling language of love that was written there and in another moment their lips met in one long and delicious kiss sweet georgiana i adore you murmured arthur his glances speaking more eloquently than his words and now there breathes not a happier man on the earth's wide surface than i say georgiana say does not that happiness which i myself experience impart pleasure to you could you now do aught to torture my soul again with the agony of suspense with the despair of baffled hope believe me my dearest angel that if destiny in its malignant spite were now to separate us if to-morrow i came and found you gone or here but cold and altered in a word if any impediment were to arise to the accomplishment of our union i should not survive the blow as a distracted maniac should i be borne to a mad cell or if my reason were left me my grave would be stained with a suicide's blood georgiana was appalled by this terrible announcement and in the agony of feeling which it excited within her she cast a glance of profound tenderness upon the earl unwittingly pressing his hand at the same time oh now i know that you entertain the same sentiments as myself he cried mistaking those convulsive movements on her part for the tender evidences of love now i know that your heart beats in unison with mine oh thrice happy day the happiest that i ever yet have known and happier does it seem too because it has dissipated so much previous anxiety healed so much acutely felt pain yes dearest georgiana i am almost glad that you rejected my suit the other day for the wretched feelings of the interval have by contrast made the present moment indescribably sweet and shall i tell you my beloved one that i am now acquainted with the nature of that secret that secret cried georgiana with a cold shudder which ellingham did not perceive for at the moment he pressed her fondly towards him yes dearest he continued i know all the power which that secret influence must occasionally have over you and believe me when i declare that instead of being any longer annoyed at the fact of that circumstance having induced you to refuse my hand the other day i deeply sympathize with you and if i now allude to that event that incident which years ago at your late father's country residence in hampshire a short convulsive sob burst from georgiana's breast oh pardon me pardon me beloved one cried the earl again imprinting a kiss upon her lips i know that i was wrong to allude to an event which you can never entirely forget but if i mentioned it ere now it was for the first and the last time and merely to convince you that he whom you will soon receive as your husband is aware of that secret influence which holds us sway over your mind and that he implores you to forget it to abandon yourself only to the thoughts of that happiness which our love and our brilliant social position must ensure us and now my dearest georgiana no more on that head never again let the topic enter into our discourse never let us allude to it even by a single syllable oh generous excellent-hearted noble-minded man exclaimed georgiana and is your love for me indeed so strong as this can you doubt it dearest said the earl if so tell me how i can prove its sincerity have you not given me a proof the most convincing that man can give to a woman asked lady hatfield concealing her blushing countenance 
on arthur's breast are you not content to receive as your wife one who no more no more exclaimed the earl tenderly hushing her words with kisses have we not agreed never again to allude to that topic but one word arthur said georgiana only one word who could have acquainted you your uncle dearest answered lord ellingham that excellent man who has been mainly instrumental in procuring me the happiness which i now enjoy my uncle murmured lady hatfield her soul subdued with astonishment of the most overwhelming nature but the earl's ears caught not the repetition of his answer neither did he notice the effect which it produced upon georgiana for her head was pillowed upon his breast his hand clasped hers her fine form leant against him and he had no thought save of the pure but intoxicating happiness which he now enjoyed o oh, love thou art the sweetest charm of life the dearest solace in this sphere of trial and vicissitude the sentiment that shining on us as a star adds the most refulgent brightness to our lot ambition never imparted consolation to the breaking spirit and places no curb on the wild passions and insatiable vices which too often dominate the human heart wealth makes its possessor envied but also encourages the daring of the robber or sharpens the knife of the murderer who seeks to grasp it honours engender hatred in the breasts of those who once were friends pleasure is bought by gold and must be paid for over and over again by the health genius is a consuming fire like the spur to the gallant steed it urges its votary on but draws the life-blood in the act glory is the eruption of the volcano bright majestic and resplendent to gaze upon yet bearing death in its halo but thou o love art the star which beams brighter as the gloom of this cold and selfish world becomes darker thou art the sunshine of the soul teaching man to emulate the gentleness the resignation and the holy devotion of woman and raising woman but one removed from the nature of angels End of section eighteen